Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just another tinfoil hat. Welcome to my show. Today, we are going to be discussing yet another classic from my favorite era of paranormal investigation, the bizarre case of Momo, the Missouri monster. And like many of these classic cases, the longer you look at it, the stranger it becomes. So at first glance, Momo appears to be simply a Sasquatch in desperate need of a haircut. And indeed, that's really one of the more defining characteristics of this hairy, scary hominid is the length of hair. Standing by Peely at six to seven feet tall, witnesses claimed that the creature was absolutely covered in a long dark brown or black hair excluding the hands. And the hair apparently was so long that it actually obscured the face of the creature, made it look like it had no neck. Now, one of the first sightings of a creature matching Momo's description, and a quick note here, Momo is the abbreviation for Missouri, M-O, and the first two letters of the word monster, so Missouri monster. I got such a kick out of that when I was a kid and still do. It's an awesome name. Anyway, one of the first sightings of Momo occurred about a year before Momo mania would really hit. In July of 1971, two friends, Joan Mills and Mary Ryan, decided to stop along Highway 79 just north of Louisiana, Missouri to eat a picnic lunch. It's pretty, pretty picturesque, right? Well, while they were eating their lunch, it was suddenly interrupted by a hideous odor and a moment later, it was evident what was causing the stench. What they described as a half-ape, half-human, standing in a nearby thicket. Now, this thing began gurgling. One of the witnesses described the noise as someone trying to whistle underwater. And the two women did exactly what most normal people would do. They ran into the car, closed and locked the doors, and then realized that they forgot their keys in the purse on the picnic blanket. So they're absolutely trapped in the car, and the creature actually comes over, gurgling all the way, and strokes the hood of the vehicle before trying to open the door. Now it's at this point that Joan hits the horn and the creature jumps back, startled. So she does the rational thing, continues laying on the horn. The creature at some point here decides it's obviously not dangerous, and smarter than the average bear, it goes over and raids the picnic, specifically a peanut butter sandwich actually picks up Joan's purse more momentarily, tosses it down, and then moseys back into the woods from whence it came. So after taking a moment, or maybe a mo moment, to be sure that the thing was really gone, one of the witnesses dashed out of the car, grabbed the keys, and promptly sped all the way to St. Louis, where they finally filed a report with the Missouri State Patrol. Flash forward approximately a year later, July 11th, 1972, around 3.30 in the afternoon. Two boys, Terry and Wally Harrison, aged eight and five, were playing in their backyard at the base of Marsolf Hill, or Star Hill, as it's known locally. Their 15-year-old sister Doris was in the house when suddenly she heard the boys screaming. Upon looking out the window, she saw, you may have guessed it, a six to seven foot tall, long, dark-haired thing, which stood on two legs. And terrifying as this encounter alone is, to make matters even creepier, the thing was flecked in blood and carrying a dead dog under its arm. And coincidentally enough, um, a local farmer claimed that in the days around the incident, his new dog had disappeared. Now a quick note here, dead dogs show up a lot in the paranormal. I mean, the truth is dead livestock and domestic animals in general show up a lot. But particularly the dogs, dead dogs, sick dogs, and missing dogs, they come up time and time again in reference to these cases. I mean, note the dog from the Flatwoods Monster case, which was so badly affected by the same illness which plagued the human witnesses that it died. In the Mothman case, one of the initial witnesses, Merle Partridge, who was coined as Newell Partridge in the Mothman prophecies, said that his German Shepherd bandit ran in the direction of good old Red Eyes and just absolutely vanished. And interestingly enough, the next night in the infamous Scarberry Mallet encounter, a dead dog showed up by the roadside and then vanished in the space of several minutes. Following this pattern in the Momo case as well, not only did the creature have one of man's best friends tucked under its arm, but the Harrison family dog would be intensely sickened by the incident, including reddened eyes and vomiting for hours afterward. Thankfully, unlike in the Flatwoods Monster case, the Harrison dog was totally fine after a quick meal of bread and milk. Three days after this initial encounter, the Harrison children's father, Edgar, a Pentecostal minister, had just finished up the Friday evening prayer meeting at their house. About a dozen members of the congregation were outside milling around talking with Harrison when they spotted two fireballs flying over Mars off Hill, one white, the other green. The objects apparently descended near an abandoned school. 
About 45 minutes after this, Harrison began hearing ringing noises, which he thought might be rocks being thrown into this metal water reservoir at the top of the hill. After an especially loud ring, growling started up, which got progressively louder. And it was at this point that the rest of the family tore out of the house and insisted that they drive away. Two police officers, Jerry Floyd and John Whitaker, were called to the scene but found nothing out of the ordinary. However, it was later that evening, which would be the first time where Edgar Harrison would encounter the infamous stench. He took several others up to Marsoff Hill to investigate and came upon an old building. From this building emanated what he described as a moldy horse or strong garbage aroma, which he realized would be smelled every time they came across an area with strange noises. Now, strange growls actually weren't the only unexplained noises in the area at the time. Reports also came in of a woman screaming or a baby crying, and this is common across hauntings as well as monster reports, which was noticed, of course, by John Keel in The Complete Guide to Mysterious Beings. Not only were these common around the time of the Momo sightings, but there's actually a history of such noises, specifically with phantom screams, in the area, just like there is also a tradition of spook lights in the area. In addition to that, as recorded in Momo, The Strange Case of the Missouri Monster by Lyle Blackburn, there are at least two reports of disembodied voices outdoors in the area at the time. Now, the Harrison family would continue to be plagued by the mysterious creature, even though the wife and kids actually packed up and lived in the restaurant the Harrison family managed in town, never to return to the house. Edgar, on the other hand, completely devoted himself to solving the mystery, in spite of the fact that he had never even seen the creature. On the 19th, a posse of 20 people, including Edgar Harrison and police chief Shelby Ward, marched over Marsoff Hill and nothing was found. However, the next day, Harrison, in the company of his daughter's boyfriend Richard Bliss, Fate Magazine and Chicago's Irish Times reporter Richard Crow, and investigator Lauren Smith went back to Marsoff Hill, and this time they wouldn't be disappointed. Although none of them actually had a visual sighting of the creature, several strange facts were soon unearthed. First of all was a circular spot of brush, which appeared to have been cleared of leaves and twigs. And this is a quick little interesting thing. And of course, this all could be coincidental. You know, the clearing of brush, that is something that great apes would do. And if, if that's the running theory we have for Bigfoot and Bigfoot-like creatures, that would make a lot of sense. However, when I see the term circular clearing of insert vegetation here, the very first thing I think of is UFO encounters. I mean, circular clearings of brush have been associated with UFOs, fairies, witches, demons, you name it, um, since forever. And so it's very interesting that here we have a creature that specifically cleared a circular area. Again, could be totally coincidental, could just be grade 8 behavior. I just find the idea that it's an absolute circle very interesting, because it sounds like this was not really a bedding site, which is typically the behavior we would associate with these clearings. But anyway, moving on. There was also evidence that something had been digging through a nearby garbage dump. And again, here we have something which could be animal behavior, also, garbage dumps are known high strangeness areas. Finally, two dogs' graves had been opened and their bones scattered. Also, two tracks, one of a foot, the other a curved impression of a hand, were found in the hard soil. Further analysis by the Oklahoma City Zoo director stated that these prints were not caused by a living creature, but rather something like a snow mitten or a dish glove, which is super weird. A quick note on tracks, too. There were several anomalous tracks found in... Louisiana, Missouri around this time. One was a known hoax, so that's always something to be wary of. But anyway, continuing on to Marsolf Hill. While near an abandoned shack that Harrison thought may have been the creature's cozy home away from home, suddenly the family dog who had accompanied the four-man posse ran off. It was just done. It was out of there. After it ran off came an overwhelming odor, this time described as rotten flesh or foul water. Despite searching with a flashlight, none of the men saw anything though in the distance, all the dogs in the neighborhood went absolutely berserk. Sightings of Moa continue with a pretty great degree of regularity throughout the rest of August, and there are still sightings of a similar creature reported to this very day. Along with the creature flap of that time, however, you also have pretty much a UFO flap going on at the same time, people coming forward saying that they're seeing strange lights or even unexplained craft in the sky throughout that summer of 1972. And this is occurring with a much higher degree of regularity than it ever had before in conjunction with the history of spook lights. Interestingly enough, some of the first investigators on the scene were MUFON field investigators, and one of the predominant theories for the creature was that it was some sort of extraterrestrial visitor. 
Now this really brings something up, because growing up with an interest in the paranormal, but especially an interest in cryptozoology, that is now almost exclusively how Momo is listed, is as a cryptid. Of course, with the extraterrestrial hypothesis kind of lurking on the horizon, as it usually does. But Momo typically now is seen to be some sort of undiscovered creature, pretty much just an offshoot of Bigfoot, with slight behavioral and physical differences. However, as is usually the case with these really classic monster flaps, you have a lot of high strangeness kind of thrown into the bargain, and Momo is no exception there. Aside from the sightings of things in the sky, you also have the dog connection, you have a close proximity to waterways, a lot of sightings were in or near the water. You also have the circular brush clearing, as well as the disembodied voices and screams. So the question remains, how much of this can we still chalk up to the predominant theory, which is that this is some sort of undiscovered primate? And yes, quite a bit of it can be. The dead dog thing, of course an ape has the ability to kill a dog. The brush circle, again, typically when this is found in conjunction with Bigfoot sightings and of course with Momo, it's absolutely chalked up to the great ape nesting or bedding behavior. The proximity of waterways. If there's a river in the area, if there's a creature in the area, it's just a simple matter of you will probably see that creature on the water at some point. However, there is something which really doesn't add up. And that is the fact that three separate types of paranormal phenomena decided to flare up and have a flap at exactly the same time. And that's exactly what happened in the summer of 1972. That area, the area around Louisiana, Missouri, has a long history of creature sightings, it has a long history of spook lights, and it has a long history of spectral voices. However, each of these reached an all-time high in the regularity of sightings or encounters in the summer of 1972. And that is something that's very interesting, because that kind of lends evidence to the idea that perhaps these seemingly different types of paranormal phenomena are connected, or that perhaps there are conditions in certain places at certain times which make them likelier to happen. Well, if you enjoyed this show on the Show Me State's Show-Stopping Monster, please like. And if you're new to this field of crop circles, go ahead and subscribe if you want to see what weirdness the future may hold. Until then, you can catch me on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. My podcast is called Just Another Tinfoil Hat. New episodes every other Monday and all old episodes available on Podbean. And if you want to keep up with whatever else I might possibly have going on, you can check out my website, which is also called, if you can believe it, justanothertinfoilhat.com. With that said, I am Zelia Edgar, signing off. Doing.